안내 말씀드리겠습니다. 잠시 후 키플랫폼 2017 분과회의가 시작될 예정입니다. 참가자분들께서는 모두 입장해 주시기 바랍니다. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? The breakout session will begin shortly. Please enter into the hall and kindly remain in your seat. 원활한 세션 진행을 위해 가지고 계신 휴대폰의 전원을 잠시 꺼주시기 바랍니다. 키플랫폼 2017에서는 동시 통역을 제공하고 있습니다. 한국어는 채널 1번, 영어는 2번이오니 통역기 이용에 참고하시기 바랍니다. For the smoothest progress of the session, the power to turn off your cell phone will appreciate it. For your information, the session also will provide a simultaneous translation. Please note the channel 1 for Korean, the channel 2 for English. 아, 잘 들리시나요? 이렇게 오늘 많이들 참석해 주셔서 어, 정말로 감사드리고요. 에. 분과 세션, 금융분과 세션 1번 첫 번째 세션을 맡은 서강대학교 겸임교수로 있는 변부환입니다. 반갑습니다. <웃음> 어느 때보다도 불확실성이 너무나 커지고 있는 요즘이 아닌가 생각이 됩니다. 예, 특히 한반도를 둘러싼 어, 정세도 어, 정말로 어, 더 불확실성이 커져가고 있고요. 어, 유럽에서 이제 제가 있는 유럽에서 어, 또 보면은 어, 작년에 그리고 올해까지 브렉시트, 그 다음에 프렉시트, 넥시트, 그 다음에 와레버 엑시트 정말로 많은 불확실성들이 증가되고 있는 요즘입니다. 어, 이러한 현실, 특히 우리 동북아의 이러한 상황 속에서도 어, 정말로 4차 산업의 혁명은 어, 새로운 가치들을 창출해낼 수 있는 아주 중요한 원동력으로 작용할 것으로 저희는 보고 있고 그러한 주제를 중심으로 이번 키 플랫폼 세션을 준비하였습니다. 올해가 제 개인적으로는 3년째 참석하는데요. 어, 정말로 더 날로 매해년 매년마다 이 어, 세션을 진행하면서 어, 우리 연사분들과 그 다음에 함께 공유하며 함께 고민하며 어, 이렇게 새롭게 주제들을 만들어가는 과정들이 어, 더 강해지는 그러한 것들을 느낄 수 있습니다. 특히나 우리 전 세계 각지에서 연사들이 오래 오셨는데요. 어, 우리 북한의 문제 때문에 많이들 가족분들을 데리고 오시는데 걱정들 좀 하셨습니다. 예, 그럼에도 불구하고 우선 이렇게 모두 다 어, 우리 프렌드십과 커미트먼트를 어, 보여주신 우리 각지에서 온 연사님들께 다시 한번 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. Thank you for your commitment and friendship. Thank you. 아, 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 어, 저는 지금 14년째 네덜란드에서 살고 있습니다. 예, 제가 네덜란드에서 근무하고 있는 곳은 ABN 암로라는 은행이고요. 어, 매일 아침 여러분들 아주 이렇게 흔한 모습을 네덜란드에 오시면 보실 수 있습니다. 아침에 출근하는 풍경입니다. 예, 제가 저도 어, 처음에 근무를 시작할 때한 2년 정도 이렇게 자전거를 타고 매일 출근을 했었습니다. 네. 한 20분 정도 걸리는 거리였는데요 어, 2년 정도 똑같은 길을 가다가 제가 발견을 한게 하나 있었습니다 바로 이 작은 다리였습니다 어, 이 다리를 통해서 가면 가는 길 오는 길 통합 5분씩 해서 총 10분을 결합할 수 있었는데 저는 2년 동안 이 길을 몰랐던 겁니다 가던 길만 가기 때문이죠 물론 12년 전 일이기 때문에 요즘같이 여러분들 손 안에 있는 내비게이터가 작동을 그렇게 잘할 시절이 아니었었죠. 요즘 같으면 당연히 내비게이터를 켜고 스마트폰을 사용을 해서 길을 찾으면 금방 쇼트컷이 나올 수 있는 그런 시대에 우리는 살고 있습니다. 이 방법 말고 그러면 어떤 방법들이 있을까? 한 번도 가보지 않았던 길을 방법들이 있겠죠. 오늘은 매번 이 길을 갔지만 아, 이 길로 한번 다른 길을 한번 통해서 가보는 게 어떨까? 라고 생각을 해볼 수도 있을 겁니다. 또 하나는 똑같은 길을 가는 사람들한테 물어보는 방법이 있겠죠. 
당신은 어떻게 그 목적지를 향해 가십니까? 나와 다른 방법은 어떤 방법들이 있습니까? 그리고 어떻게 똑같은 목표를 향해 달려가고 있습니까? 또 자전거의 사례입니다 늘 우리가 걷고 있는 이 길과 다른 길을 만나게 되면 익숙하지 않은 것이 사실입니다 특히나 매일 우리가 겪고 있는 그러한 루틴한 삶 속에서 있는 일이라면 더욱 그렇죠 2분 정도의 비디오 클립을 여러분들과 함께 공유를 하고 다음 슬라이드로 넘어가도록 하겠습니다 지금 비디오에 약간 문제가 있는 것 같은데 되나요? 지원? 아, 될때 사인 주시겠습니까? 예, 될때 사인을 주시고요. 예. 초연결성의 시대, 여러분들 한국에서는 카카오 택시가 아주 유명하죠? 우버가 아직 한국에서는 많이 이렇게 활용되고 있지 않은 걸로 알고 있습니다 우버를 한 번이라도 이용해 보신 혹시 분들이 계신가요? 해외 나가셨을 때? 예. 카카오 택시와 아주 비슷한 그런 형태인데 예, 뒤, 뒤에 몇분 계신데 어, 스마트폰, 스마트폰을 열고 내가 서 있는 위치에서 택시를 부릅니다 그러면 내가 가고자 하는 목적지를 찍으면 그 목적지까지의 예상 금액이 나오고요 예상 시간이 나오고 그리고 어떤 종류의 택시가 여러분 앞에 몇 분까지 도착할 건지 예상 시간이 뜹니다. 동시에 그 택시 운전기사가 여태까지 우버 택시를 운전을 하면서 얼마나 좋은 웨이팅과 피드백을 받았는지까지 뜨게 되죠. 택시기사의 입장, 택시기사분의 입장에서는 하염없이 승객을 기다리지 않으셔도 됩니다. 늘 다니시면서 콜이 들어오는 것을 찍어서 제일 가까운 지역으로 억셉트를 해서 가시면 되죠. 승객의 입장에서는, 패신저 입장에서는 내가 있는 어느 위치든 얼마 어느 내가 가고자 하는 그 거리까지 얼마의 가격에 그리고 지금의 내가 지불하는 택시 가격보다 훨씬 더 좋은 가격으로 택시를 이용할 수가 있게 되는 그런 세상이 됐습니다. 이 우버는 단한 대의 택시도 소유하지 않은 글로벌 택시 회사가 되었습니다. 마켓캡이 지금 얼마인지 아십니까 혹시? 예상치가 66조 원에 해당하는 마켓캡을 갖고 있고요. 매년 20조 원의 레비뉴를 올리고 있습니다. 전 세계에서 제일 큰 택시 운송 회사가 되어버렸죠. 이 가장 파워풀한 택시 회사가 된 이유는 바로 커넥티비티, 인터넷이 가능하게 되는 인터넷이 만들어가는 세상이 가장 큰 원동력이고 동시에 승객과 운전자 간의 정보가 서로 오픈돼서 공유된다는 점입니다. 승객은 택시를 내리자마자 동시에 메시지를 받게 됩니다. 얼마나 택시를 이용하신 거에 만족하십니까? 별 하나부터 다섯 개까지 레이팅을 주게 되어 있는데 레이팅이 별네개 밑으로 가면 그 운전사는 더 이상 우버 택시를 운전할 수 없게 됩니다. 또 역시 운전자는 승객을 레이팅을 매길 수 있게 되었습니다. 얼마나 이 승객이 매너가 좋고 그리고 공손하고 그리고 위협적이지 않고 프렌들리했는지를 매기게 되어 있죠. 자, 비디오가 지금 가능하니까요. 먼저 비디오를 시청하고 그 다음 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 
I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill, and I was really proud of it. Everything changed, though, when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle, and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Justin Salem. First attempt riding the bicycle. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it. But that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just...
단순히 블록체인, 블록체인 혼자 어, 새로운 산업의 영역을 구축하는 것이 아니고 기존에 있는, 세, 기존에 있는 다른 산업들과 함께 새로운 가치를 창출해내는 그런 모습으로 진화하고 있는 것들을 볼수 있는 거죠. 월마켓은 어, 푸드 세이프티를 위해서 블록체인 도입을 검토하고 있고요. 네덜란드의 16개 은행을 포함한 로지스틱 회사들은 컨소시엄을 구성해서 블록체인의 활용 방안을 지금 연구 중에 있습니다. 어떻습니까? 정말로 새로운 방법들이 많이 지금 벌어지고 있고 시도들이 이루어지고 있죠. 우리가 대한민국이 기존에 해왔던 그러한 산업 구조와는 정말로 다른 어, 양상들이 벌어지고 있는 것입니다. 오늘 여러분들이 제일 많이 또 접하실 세 가지 단어가 있으실 건데 이러한 초연결성이 추구하는 가치들은 바로 trust, 신뢰입니다. 서로의 정보들을 오픈하고 그런 오픈된 정보들이 인스턴트하게 서로 피드백을 제공하면서 트러스트를 형성해 나가고 있고 또 하나는 동시에 트랜스페런시 투명한 사회로 점점 더 가고 있는 것을 볼 수가 있고요. 이러한 가치들이 결국 추구하는 것은 현재 트레디셔널한 밸류 크리에이션 메소드에서 다음 단계 즉 전환을 추구를 하고 있다는 것입니다. 우리의 예를 한번 볼까요? 대한민국이 1960년대부터 2015년도까지의 총 GDP를 그래프로 나타난 것입니다. 엄청난 성장을 일으켰습니다. 1965년 3 billion 총 국내 총 생산이 3조 정도에 해당했습니다. 2015년 1.4 trillion 총 460배가 성장을 했습니다. 50년 동안. 엄청난 경이로운 여태까지 단한 번도 그 언어 하나도 달성하지 못했던 그러한 성과고 앞으로도 달성하기 힘든 성과라고 저희는 생각하고 있습니다. 어떻게 이런 것들이 가능했느냐. 저희 아버님 세대 그리고 선배들 세대의 땀과 눈물과 열정 그리고 하드워킹으로 이루어낸 성과입니다. 그러한 하드워킹을 통해서 퀄러티와 그리고 양적으로 정말로 많은 프로덕트를 생산해냈던 것이죠. 우리 스스로 없던 우리나라에서 구할 수 없었던 원료들을 사서 제조를 해서 또 다른 가치를 더해가지고 해외로 팔았던 결과죠. 또 이렇게 단기간에 이러한 성과를 얻을 수 있었던 이유는 바로 포커스죠. 집중적으로 우리가 추구하고자 했던 그러한 산업들을 어, 어, 발전시켜 나갔던 그런 결과였던 거고 또 하나 어, 탑다운 어프로치가 정말로 이러한 성과를 만들어내는데 주의했다고 볼수 있습니다. 이러한 우리의 가치관이 그리고 이러한 우리가 추구했던 이러한 방법들이 과연 4차 산업 새롭게 변화하고 있는 초연결성의 시대에서도 작동할 수 있을지 진지하게 질문을 던져야 하는 시점에 와 있습니다. 과연 우리가 추구했던 이러한 방법들이 미래를 위해서도 제대로 작동할 것인지 대한민국의 지표를 가장 잘 나타내는 월드 이코노믹 포럼에서 매년 발표하는 지표 중에 하나입니다. 2016년도 대한민국의 경제, 경쟁력 지수는 2013년도에 19위에서 26위로 다섯, 여섯, 일곱 단계 하락을 했습니다. 하락한 가장 큰 이유는 바로 인스티튜션. 얼마나 제도적으로 우리가 안정적인 그러한 제도적인 것들을 잘 가지고 갖고 있느냐. 그 다음에 파이낸셜 마켓 관련된 부분들이 제일 어, 다른 어, 우리와 경쟁할 수 있는 그러한 경쟁 국가들과 비교했을 때 어, 많이 처지는 영역으로 나타났고요. 특히나 어, 우리 인스티튜션의 항목들을 자세히 보면 트랜스페런시 분야가 123위로 정말로 아주 어, 좋지 않은 성적을 거두고 있는 것을 볼수 있습니다. 투명성 분야죠. 또 하나, efficiency of corporate, corporate board, 기업 보드의 효율성 역시 120위로 정말로 아주 우리의 평균 점수에 비하면 크게 수치가 떨어지는 그런 순위를 지금 보이고 있습니다. 어, 또 public trust in politicians 역시 어, 일반 대중 우리가 갖고 있는 그런 신뢰의 지수도 역시 많이 떨어지는 걸로 지금 나타나고 있고요. 금융 마켓으로 한번 가보면 ease of access to loans 
얼마나 대출에 쉽게 금융에 쉽게 어, 우리가 접근할 수 있는지 기업들이 쉽게 대출을 얻을 수 있는지 파이낸셜 마켓에서 이것도 역시 많이 어, 뒤쳐지는 점수를 지금 나타내고 있습니다. 그 다음에 은행의 안정성 역시 113위로 많이 떨어지고 있고요. 어, 아까 좀 전에 제가 슬라이드에서 정의 드렸던 그러한 4차 산업의 요구하는 새로운 가치들과 보면 은 많이 큰 차이가 있는 것을 보실 수 있습니다. 또 하나 지표를 여러분들께 보여드리겠습니다. 이거는 콜옵션 인덱스인데요. 네, 역시 한국은 어, 우리의 경제 수준에 비해서 다른 여러 선진국들과 비교했을 때 많이 뒤쳐지는 그러한 분야로 나타나고 있습니다. 우리 폴 교수님께서 2부의 좌장으로 이제 세션을 이끄실 폴 교수님께서 네, 이야기하시는 아주 어, 유명한 공식입니다. 아, New Technology, 새로운 기술에 Old Organization을 접목을 시키면 Expensive Old Organization, 비싼 오래된 조직이 될 수밖에 없다는 라 얘기죠. 이게 어떻게 진화가 돼야 되느냐. 우리 상황에 너무나 잘 맞는 이야기입니다. New Technology, Agile Organization, 즉 민첩한 조직을 가지고 있어야 Smart New Organization으로 진화가 가능하다라는 것이죠. 그러면 우리는 어떠한 것들을 해야 될까요? 우리의 문제점들은 이미 여러 글로벌한 인스티튜트에서 우리보다도 더잘 보고 있습니다. 또 우리도 잘 알고 있죠. 대한민국이 그래도 기회는 분명히 있습니다. 특히 여러분들도 잘 아시겠지만 인터넷 액세스, 인터넷 스피드 인프라스트럭처 상에서는 대한민국이 전 세계 1위를 차지하고 있습니다. 스웨덴, 노르웨이, 재팬, 네덜란드가 그 뒤를 따르고 있고요. 어, 대통령의 탄핵 그리고 어, 이라는 아주 초유의 사태를 겪으면서도 대한민국의 신용, 국가, 국제 신용 등, 국가 신용 등급은 어, 공이, S&P, 무디스, 피치 모두 아시아에서 중국과 일본에 비해서 두 단계 혹은 한 단계 높은 레이팅을 아직도 유지를 하고 있습니다. 그만큼 국제사회는 대한민국에 대한민국의 신뢰를 보내고 있다는 얘기죠. 어떻게 그러면 트랜스포메이션을 만들어 갈 것인가? 몇 가지 예를 가져왔습니다. 어, 혹시 이러한 밭을 본 적이 있으신가요? 한국에 저 아래쪽에 내려가면 인삼밭이 있습니다. 인삼밭. 예. 인삼밭인데 이게 어떻게 그러면 트랜스포메이션 될수 있는지. 그 다음에 울산과 여수에 가보시면 지금 대한민국에 새로운 오일 허브를 꿈꾸고 있습니다. 그러면 금융 섹터는 어떻게 더 트랜스폼 할수 있을 것인지. 새로운 가치들이 적용이 된다면 우리가 지금 가지고 있는 문제점들은 오히려 해결책으로 초연결성의 시대는 해결책으로 나타날 수도 있습니다. 한 가지 예를 들어드리겠습니다. 지금 저렇게 정말로 전통적으로 한국에서 인삼을 많이 생산을 하고 해외로 많이 수출을 하는 이 커뮤니티가 지역이 있습니다. 그런데 지금 아주 큰 위기에 직면을 하고 있어요. 똑같은 거의 똑같은 제품에 인삼이 중국에서 생산이 되고 있는 것이죠. 그리고 그것이 한국의 제품과 비교할 수 없게끔 지금 해외시장으로 팔리고 있는 것입니다. 어떻게 이것들을 해결할 수 있을까요? 바로 초연결성의 시대, 신뢰와 투명성을 갖춘 시스템을 구축하여서 전 세계 어느 지역이라도 이것이 어느 농부에서 어느 시점에 생산되어 있다는 것을 시스템화할 수 있는 시기가 도래하였습니다. 그러한 노력을 지금 이 지자체는 추진을 하고 있고요. 어, 희망적으로 본다면 내년 이 시점 정도에서는 좋은 성과가 나타나서 정말로 글로벌 정말 아주 로컬 지금 플레이스지만 글로벌 트레이딩이 가능한 새로운 허브로 변모하는 모습들을 보실 수도 있을 겁니다 역시 마찬가지로 동부가 오일 허브를 꿈꾸고 있는 우리 대한민국의 새로운 초연결성의 경쟁력이 더해진다면 새로운 가치들을 얼마든지 창출해낼 수 있을 거라고 생각을 합니다 금융 작년, 재작년 정말 많이 이야기했던 부분입니다. 잘안 보실, 안 보실 것 같은데 특히 장, 2015년도에 
어, 메인 메시지 중에 하나였던 것은 과연 우리의 금융 섹터가 롱텀 비전을 가지고 새로운 가치를 창출해낼 수 있는 구조를 가지고 있는지 그럴만한 우리 탑 매니지먼트의 커미트먼트가 있고 역량이 있고 그럴만한 시간적인 여유가 있는지에 대해서 많이 논의를 했었고요. 동시에 국제사회가 추구하는 그러한 가치들을 함께 추구하며 만들어갈 수 있는 그런 금융구조로 우리가 얼만큼 변모할 수 있는지 그러한 역량들을 진단을 했었습니다. 많이 부족했었죠. 또 하나는 진정으로 글로벌 은행이 되려면 글로벌 리스크를 관리하고 매니지할 수 있는 그러한 또 캐파시티가 내부적으로 성장해야 된다는 이야기도 역시 했었습니다. 초연결성 시대 새로운 가치와 그리고 서로 융합되는 그러한 산업 구조 속에서 이제 금융의 모습도 전통적으로 어떻게 하면 글로벌 뱅크가 되겠다 글로벌 금융기관이 되겠다라는 것을 이제 뛰어넘어야 되는 시점에 다다르고 있습니다. 아까 예로 말씀드렸던 것처럼 인삼을 생산하고 있는 그 로컬 시장이 새로운 트레이딩 허브로 진화하면서 금융의 역할을 새로 고려할 수 있을 것이고요. 또 울산과 여수에 새롭게 구축되고 있는 동부가 오일 허브를 새로운 가치들을 만들어가면서 금융의, 금융의 역할을 또 함께 발전시켜 나갈 수 있을 것입니다. 마지막 슬라이드 두개더 설명드리고 제 강연을 마치도록 하겠습니다. 17세기에 네덜란드가 골든 에이지를 누릴 수 있었습니다. 새로운 가치 그리고 종교적인 자유를 찾아서 떠났던 그러한 사람들이 네덜란드로 모이면서 정말로 도시는 활성화되고 선박기 선박 어, 건조를 통해서 그리고 나침판 항해 기술을 통해서 이제 전 세계에 무역을 시작을 하게 됩니다. 그러면서 예술도 발전을 하게 되고요. 그리고 새로운 주식 시장도 세계 최초로 네덜란드에서 어, 소개가 됩니다. 이런 것들이 가능할 수 있었던 그 시절에 바로 그 시기에 이런 것들이 가능할 수 있었던 이유는 새로운 가치를 그리고 다른 생각을 가지고 함께 새로운 가치를 만들 수 있는 공간을 만들었기 때문입니다. 이제 초연결성의 시대, 대한민국이 새롭게 한 단계 도약하기 위해서는 새로운 스페이스를 우리 대한민국에 만들어 가자는 것을 제의를 드립니다. 많은 전문가들과 그리고 또 많은 아이디어들이 대한민국의 IT 인프라스 IT 인프라 스트럭처와 결합을 해서 이제 함께 새로운 가치를 만들어낼 수 있는 크리에이티브한 공간을 제안을 드리면서 제 강연을 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 자, 말씀드린 것처럼 이제 다음 세션으로는 30년 이상 어, 유럽 CIO넷 Chief Information Officers의 그러한 그룹입니다. 거기에서 사무총장을 맡고 계시고요. 어, 정말로 많은 인사이트와 어, 전문성을 가지고 계신 우리 프리츠 버스마커 씨께서 나오셔가지고 어, 블록체인의 명과 암에 대해서 설명을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 큰 박수로 부탁드립니다. 감사합니다. <웃음> Um, I'm very honored to be back here in Korea. Last year I was here with my family and uh, I'm very pleased that we're back with the family. We feel very welcome and very safe being back in Korea. Thank you. Right. You may not recognize this island, but this is the island of Palau in Micronesia. And next to Palau is the island of Yap. And about a thousand years ago, um, people were using small stones, which were very difficult to, um, to mine from another a distant island. They used that as money. It's like uh, other people use shells in Africa or beads uh, by the Native Americans. So small stones are easy to carry. And obviously, the bigger the stone, the more value it has. But at a certain point, 
carrying those stone stops because this is actually what their money looks like. So this is the Yap money, it's called that I. And uh, this is actually how, how really big it is. So if you wanted to buy a boat or if you wanted to buy a house, uh, you would trade this coin. Now you would not pick up the coin and give it to somebody else. What you actually do is you would tell the community, the whole community, I have traded my money for that particular value. Basically, this is blockchain avant la lettre. Because if for a certain case you would uh, want to uh, still use that same stone uh, to buy something else, that piece of money, then the whole community would know and would challenge you that, hey, that actually stone has already been given away. It's been given away to somebody else. So in the collective minds of the people of Yap, um, that's where the information is stored. It, it's, so it's a decentralized ledger. There was no central bank uh, which uh, took care of the security. So remember this when we come back to what blockchain is about. Right. Now, in 2000, uh, sorry, in 2008, we had this uh, disrupting uh, em uh, emerging. We had a lot of technology coming our way, and because of that technology, we saw the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, little known at the time, what we also saw is a white paper in November 2008, where a guy called Satoshi Nagayoshi, um, sorry, um, Satoshi Nagamoto, um, uh, written a paper on blockchain about cryptocurrency. And this is the white paper which he posted on a crypto website. And what's interesting in the paper, first of all, that it states, for those of you in the financial institutions, it actually states, I don't know if it's actually be seen on screen, but you can actually pay somebody without going through a financial system, which should raise some concerns. Another concern at the time, was that, and still is, is that Satoshi Nakamoto when people wanted to interview him about his ideas, because they're extremely revolutionary, they could not find them. And if you analyze what Satoshi means, it's, uh, Satoshi means clear thinking, quick-witted. Naka means medium or relationship. Moto means origin or foundation. I would assume there's not a single parent out there in the world which would name his child uh, like that. And uh, now people, and they, they, they've been trying to identify who this person is. At least 10, 20 people have been identified with the person representing Satoshi Nagamoto. Uh, but to date, we still do not know who this person is. So why did we come to know about Bitcoin in the first place? Because it was quite an obscure, um, you could say, cryptocurrency at the time. Um, as a fact, uh, they, when they first started to mine cryptocurrency, uh, they used about 10,000 bitcoins uh, to pay for uh, a pizza, actually two pizza of Papa Joe's. By today's standards, that would be about $1.2 million to pay for two pizzas, about inflation. But one of the things how Bitcoin came into the market was uh, through WikiLeaks. Because WikiLeaks, um, wanted to collect funds, and Wikileaks was not able to collect funds through the normal banks because the normal banks weren't allowed to uh, accept donations on behalf of Wikileaks. So they looked at Bitcoin as an alternative to fund Wikileaks. Now, at the time, uh, Satoshi Nagamoto, or those who present that group, have asked Julian Assange, could you please not accept uh, Bitcoins because we really do not want that attention. Uh, but uh, arguably, uh, because of that attention, because of that debate, uh, the global world started to know, because of uh, WikiLeaks, that something like Bitcoin existed. And in 2011, uh, they did use Bitcoins to start to fund WikiLeaks. So, actually, what did they create? I will show you a very small clip, hopefully it will work, on uh, what his revolution idea was. Blockchain is peer-to-peer -peer software technology that protects the integrity of a digital piece of information. It was invented to create the alternative currency Bitcoin, but may be used for other cryptocurrencies, online signature services, 
voting systems, and many other applications. In this video, we explain how it works and what makes it special. Everyone uses paper money. When you get a $10 bill, you trust that it's not fake. If instead someone sent you an email saying, here's $10, you probably wouldn't trust it. But when we transfer money, use an ATM or pay with a deposit card, that's pretty much exactly what we do. We're sending money and a digital message. To make sure no one's cheating or sending money they don't have, these messages go through a few trusted banks that keep a record of everything. They know how much money everyone has and deduct it properly for every transaction. But this becomes expensive when there's a million transactions around the world every minute. The Economist estimates that banks charged us more than $1.7 trillion to process these payments in 2014. That's about 2% of the entire world economy. With blockchain, we can save a lot of this cost because it lets us send money just like sending an email. Instead of sending a lot of payment information through a few servers, blockchain uses thousands of personal computers on the internet. All transactions are copied and cross-checked between every computer in a system-wide accounting book called the Ledger, which becomes very safe at scale. Blockchain doesn't just allow us to create safe money online, it lets us protect any piece of digital information. This could be online identity cards, voter ballots, contracts, and many other legal instruments bringing bureaucracy into the 21st century. Right, bringing, bringing bureaucracy in the 21st century. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, so it talks about what it does. It doesn't talk this video about how it does. So I want to uh, quickly go with you through uh, just a, a couple of parts of the blockchain uh, method, uh, specifically the cryptology, uh, the blockchain, the technology behind blockchain. Uh, blockchain. Uh, first of all, uh, hashing or the one-way hash function. Now, this is a uh, technology developed by crypto cryptographers, which allows you to uh, enter any form of informa digital information and that can be a name, a document, or a payment statement. Doesn't matter which size it has, the hash function will translate that to a very fi a fixed uh, number. And in the example uh, of, uh, from above, you see that even if you change just one letter, the hash becomes completely different. So the input can be a name, it can be a document, whatever. But this hash function is very important because this is one of the fundaments how blockchain works. Another thing you have to know about um, cryptology is the Merkle tree, uh, invented by Ralph Merkle uh, in, in, uh, in uh, 1979. Uh, and he, he used this, he created this algorithm to start to compare data on different computers. Because you want to know if the data on one computer is the same as on the other computer. So what he realized, if I actually hash the hash itself, I get a new hash. And if I start to pair hashes, I end up with one hash at the top, which is called the root hash. So what we do in a blockchain, which I'll cover in a little bit later, is we collect all the data we want to put in a blockchain, and we hash it at a certain point that we have one hash. Then we have a very... Uh, easy way of detecting if something in that data changes. Because in example I've shown previously, if you just change one comma, one letter, one piece of information in that ledger, uh, it will change the hash. And you can always compare the root hash with the hash of you want to, when you compare it with, does it work or not. So what blockchain does, and that's why it's called blockchain, is uh, um, Every, in a time interval, people collect all those transactions, uh, hash it uh, in a Merkle tree to one hash, and then uh, it's been introduced with a, a, a timestamp, a nonce, a number only used once, by the way, uh, but also the previous hash of the previous uh, block. And then we'll get to that when th that block will be added to the blockchain. And that means it's very difficult to tamper with this information because if you change if you want to change, um, if you want to hack into a database where money is stored or other information is stored, you not only have to change that particular one block, because it's linked through the hash, you actually have to change all the previous blocks as well. And the fact that the chain grows, the fact that 
the hashes uh, which you will store on all these computers around the world, it, it also means you have to uh, change the information on all those computers around the world. Virtually, that is impossible. So this is a very good example of um, uh, you could say, uh, security by design. Now, how does a block get added to uh, the blockchain? Um, in simplified terms, basically what uh, Satoshi Nagamoto uh, did, he said, well, I want to uh, get uh, people to demonstrate proof of work uh, to solve a particular mathematical uh, question. I will not go into the details what that question is. But that mathematical question, uh, solving that is the proof of work. It's not something you can um, think, you don't have to be smart about. It is something you can only achieve by very hard work. And in the beginning, uh, you could do it on a small PC, but at the, mom uh, at the moment, the amount of work uh, which you need to do uh, to solve this is extremely costly. Uh, just to give you some numbers, uh, at the moment, uh, to find a, a, a solution to a particular problem before your block is allowed to be on the blockchain, uh, it's like finding one grain of sand on all the beaches in this world, one particular grain of sand. And what they're doing at the moment in, in, in the, the hash, uh, the, 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 the miners, they are calculating uh, 25 gigahertz of hashes per second. That's 25 with 15 zeros uh, added to it. Per second, try to find the right hash, because once you find the right hash, uh, the, the right answer to that uh, question, your block can then be accepted to the blockchain. You tell that to all the other miners who try to find that. And that's why it's called mining, because once you've done that, you, once you've found the solution, you actually get rewarded with a number of uh, bitcoins. And that bitcoins, and that then pays for your uh, mining fees. So it's extremely power intensive and computer intensive, but it's also very safe. So why is blockchain a hype? It's easy to compare it to the internet, the internet of information. When TCP was IP was uh, invented by uh, Vint Cerf 30 years ago, um, it took a couple of years before people to realize it's actually it's re it revolutionized the way we exchange. Yeah. Um, so this information highway it took about 30 years before uh, when we first uh, uh, got it to uh, get where it is right now. First case was email. And you see that the whole blockchain architecture is perceived to be the internet of value. It's a value exchange protocol. And it can virtually change the complete way we organize uh, transactions today. Well, these are some examples of companies at the moment, uh, startups uh, investing in developing blockchain technology in the finance industry. Um, at the moment, about one billion U.S. dollars is invested in these uh, industries, and um, let me check on something here. And uh, the big money, the big bets on the venture capitalists is that they will earn this money back uh, with the clearing and settlement and the global remittance, the sending of a certain amount of payment uh, across the globe. That's where they hope the big money is going to be. So a lot of companies out there uh, looking to uh, deliver blockchain solutions. But also the banks at the moment, the financial institutes, want to see how can they uh, profit from uh, that technology. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of the banks at the moment uh, using blockchain. Uh, or financial institutes like Nasdaq wants to use blockchain to actually um, um, collect and um, track all the, the, the transfers done on the Nasdaq exchange. And Santander estimates that uh, the infrastructural cost saving uh, could be uh, up to 20 billion for the banks in this world uh, by 2022. This is a very big reason, incentive to look at uh, what this is. Uh, although I have to say that where the previous startups are very much looking at public blockchains, uh, open to everybody, banks are looking at semi-public or private blockchains just for themselves. So they are fundamentally different. Right. 
So where is this blockchain happening at the moment? Oh, already in examples, I hope that you saw that it's happening all over the world. Everybody wants a piece of the action. Uh, but the, block, the global blockchain hotspots at the moment are the following. This is where uh, most of the uh, blockchain startups uh, can be found and where the expertise is. Does it stop there? No. Because who else wants to join? It's also interesting to see that uh, a lot of the major governments around the world are now uh, facilitating uh, organizations, startups, banks, uh, companies to come to where they are and uh, see if they uh, can create a blockchain hotspot. And um, dependent on which newspaper you need, which article you need, uh, either Canada, Switzerland, the Netherlands, uh, they're all uh, claiming to be a global hotspot uh, of some sort in blockchain. So the whole world is picking up on this. Right, so I'll give you a, a prime example now of how blockchain simplifies this. So what are the opportunities? Now suppose you are a company A, based in the US, and you want to send some money to company B in Japan because you bought something of that company. In a traditional way, you would call up your, your bank A in the US and say, well, could you please make that payment? Unfortunately, Bank A is not a member of a uh, declaring house system, so Bank A has to uh, go to another bank and because part of the clearing house system, could you please uh, transfer this money? No, it's not where it ends because that Bank B goes to the clearing house. Could you please transfer the money? So it's not going back to Bank B, it's actually going to a Bank C, which is the corresponding bank of the Bank D, which is then the bank in Japan before you can actually get your money. Now, this process is costly and time-consuming. So what happens when you have blockchain? You simply give the same order to bank A. Bank A executes that order, and in 10 minutes, it's uploaded into blockchain. And then bank, B could, uh, bank D could actually uh, pay company uh, B uh, the money they own. Now, this whole process takes out a lot of the complexity in the current payment system. And it also very much speeds up the process. Um, some other examples. Uh, Bitland. Uh, Bitland in Ghana um, was set up because Ghana doesn't have a central registry. Because it has, doesn't have a central registry, there's no land ownership. Because there's no land ownership, uh, there's no economic value. And by introducing blockchain, they can actually start to uh, identify land ownership. And this is a great example how blockchain is used to start to develop a macroeconomy in, uh, in, in, in Ghana uh, based on the fact that now, through blockchain, they can start to uh, assess whose land it is. And another example, uh, this is where uh, end users take control. In the normal music industry, you have these very big uh, companies out there who control the ownership and rights of the music, the distribution rights. Now, the, this Uji Music is a company set up uh, uh, in the, the Ethereum blockchain, and I believe some other speakers will talk a little bit more about Ethereum as well, because that's a blockchain not used to transfer money, but that's a blockchain to uh, set up smart contracts, where actually in the code you identify uh, what you want to have to do, done in that contract. And that Ethereum system is used to then dis, uh, distribute music. And uh, Tiny, Mu uh, Tiny Human, that's a song written by Imogen Heap, is the very first song which was released on this website. And this allows now uh, a singer-songwriter as an individual to control uh, her creative, uh, the, you could say, ideas and distribution rights through the use of blockchain. Um, Fitbit. Uh, why Fitbit? Uh, there's a bank in New York, in, 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 sorry, an insurance company in New York who uses Fitbits to um, uh, track people's uh, steps and they get rewarded uh, when they make certain steps and that, that reward uh, can then be used through a, a, a microtransfer system to actually fund insurances in uh, Zambia at the moment. So it's their way of uh, introducing corporate social responsibility. 
or a, uh, this is an uh, example of a German conglomerate uh, where um, for e-cars, rather than using the traditional payment system, they're using blockchain technology for micropayments to pay for uh, loading up your electric car, to make payments on the highway or payments and parking. Uh, so it's a way to automate the use of that car or car sharing because uh, it's extremely safe and uh, quick to use. It's also being used by Toyota. They're going to experiment with that. Uh, in uh, Japan, you, you lease a lot of cars, and they're actually using the smart contract concept of Ethereum to um, check if actually made your monthly payment. And through that same smart contract, if you haven't met your uh, monthly payment, uh, they can also actually switch off your car uh, remotely. So it's executing a smart contract through a blockchain. OK. Um, I see I'm over time, so I will, uh, Boyang, if that's OK, I will quickly scan through the rest of the information without expanding all the benefits. I assume the slides will be shared with the audience. Yeah. So, uh, but the highlighted benefits, uh, blockchain uh, cuts out the middleman. Um, uh, it, it actually it allows process integrity because what's in the blockchain is how it's executed. But there are also some concerns uh, in blockchain. I'll briefly cover just a couple. Uh, realizing that uh, if you look uh, at blockchain from a bank's perspective, uh, banks uh, earn their money with the complexity of the finance system. And if you take away that complexity, if you make life easier, how can they uh, earn money again? Uh, same applies for central uh, government uh, handing out money. So, uh, if we now have a, uh, a system without the use of a central government, which allows us to start to uh, trade money. So the concern there is about governance. Give you a couple of um, examples also of where uh, you could say security is a risk. Um, security in one uh, example is Silk Road. A couple of years ago, 2011, Silk Road was set up um, on the, the dark side of the internet. It uh, was mainly used to, to, to trade drugs, and cryptocurrency uh, was used in the blockchain, um, uh, you could say, uh, uh, usage to uh, trade money. So that doesn't help with, you could say, getting the tr gaining the trust of the general public. Uh, you may have heard about the Mount Gox example, where somebody uh, stole uh, 850,000 bitcoins, about $450 million of uh, bitcoins, uh, just by uh, finding the loopholes in the technology. Because one of the problems also with security is, we, it, this is a new field, it's nascent technology. So we're assuming the code is uh, safe, but people will find holes. Uh, just like... Uh, Last uh, security example, Ethereum, the smart chain, uh, the, the, the smart contract uh, platform. There were a couple of very, I'd say, adventurous people who uh, set up a decentralized autonomous uh, organization. They actually set up a venture capitalist firm without a leadership team. And a venture capitalist firm collected 150 million US dollars. And then one of the hackers making use of the rules set up by the smart contracts in Ethereum actually was able to take out $40 million uh, from that venture capitalist firm with actually not breaking the rules. So it is a trial and error situation. People are trying to understand how it works or not. OK. As mentioned, it's very cost-consuming uh, uh, cost, uh, and, and uh, energy-consuming. And also, the skills need to understand blockchain um, are not, uh, you could say, widely available. They're very scarce resources. You have to understand the, na the latest uh, programming technology like Solidity, LLL, or Serpent, and those uh, technologies are not readily uh, available at the moment. So, uh, some challenges uh, is in the area of, it is new technology, uh, so we're going to uh, make mistakes and uh, costly mistakes understanding how it works. Uh, and also, one of the big um, uh, issues with blockchain is a completely different type of architecture. Uh, so it's going to be very costly and difficult to integrate in the current system because you have to replace your existing technology. Uh, now, so a quick conclusion uh, I would like to draw. Uh, 
blockchain has a lot of advantages. Blockchain could be the technology which supports the whole shift in this world where we're moving from a command and control with centralized uh, systems to a connect and collaborate world, which is a network. But the problem is, is that over the, the, uh, we don't, don't fully understand its implications yet. Uh, but I do believe that um, if we want to move into this 21st century, uh, we will need technology which will support that. And blockchain, for me, I believe, representing a big CIO community, is that uh, this is the technology will bring us the bureaucracy back uh, into the 21st century. So having said that, um, I think we'll have a debate later and we'll cover probably a little bit more. But so this is an introduction into, uh, I would say, the, the opportunities of blockchain. And please realize this is a foundational change. And it's going to take at least 20, 30 years to be accepted, just like TCP IP, as the platform for all our trades and transactions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Fritz. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 그 에서는, uh, 한 가지 여러분들과 공유하고 싶은 게 하나 있습니다. 뭐냐면, uh, 그 너무나 모든 것들이 빨리 변하고 있고 새로운 가치들이 uh, 생겨나고 있기 때문에 uh, 그 누구도 자기 자신이 한 분야에 있어서 어, 끊임없는 전문가가 전문가로서 남아 있을 수 없다는 거죠. 네. 어느 순간 어, 노력 계속 끊임없는 자기 혁신의 노력이 이루어지지 않고서는 예, 그 위치를 어느 순간 잃어버릴 수도 있는 겁니다. 여러분들께 제안 드리는 거는 이렇게 오늘 전문가 분들이 여기 와서 이제 토론을 하고 발표를 하고 하시는데 혹시 어떤 아이디어라도 좋으니까요. 공유를 하고 싶고 같이 새로운 가치를 어, 우리 대한민국 이 공간에서 어, 창출해 내고 싶으신 그런 아이디어나 생각들이 있으시면 언제든지 웰컴입니다. 언제든지 오셔서 함께 논의하시고 토론하시고 상의하셨으면 좋겠습니다. 그리고 개인별로 어, 이 컨퍼런스가 끝나고 나서도 얼마든지 커넥션이 가능합니다. 특히 저희 행사장 앞에 대퍼라는 앱을 제가 소개를 하고 있는데 그 앱을 먼저 다운로드 받으시고 여기 있는 모든 그 스피커들과 함께 1대1 커넥션도 다 가능하시니까요. 예, 언제든지 예, 커넥션 하시고 계속 컨퍼런스 이외에도 예, 지속적으로 연결이 됐으면 좋겠습니다. 어, 다시 한번 우리 프리츠 씨께 감사드리고 어, 타타 컨설턴시 한국 대표로 계십니다. 어, 알고 계신 분들은 그 영역에서 잘 알고 계실 건데요. 예, 타타 컨설턴시는 뭐전 어, 세계 금융, 플로, 금융 플랫폼을 어, 제공하고 어, 서비스하는 업체로 아주 실력이 있는 회사로 알려져 있습니다. 한국 대표 까말 요스 대표님 모시도록 하겠습니다. 야, yeah, please come. Good afternoon. I'm Kamal Joshi, part of Tata Consultancy Services. We are predominantly a technology company uh, with close to 1,200 customers around the globe. Uh, I wish you thank Fritz for the first session because he's laid a very clear foundation for all of us to know what is blockchain all about, what is expected, what it is expected of it, and also how the industry is expected to use or utilize the technology, the brainchild of blockchain in its different applications. So what I'm going to cover today is essentially three parts of how technology is becoming a disruption, how blockchain is creating an impact, and how do we look at what preparations we need to be doing, and how do we need to be aware of certain things that will help us counter forthcoming challenges. To give a perspective, today in the world, when you are looking at business, the business is all about trust, which is provided today by governments, which is to provided today by regulators in the market, and it is provided by the various financial institutions, for example, clearing and settlement institutions, which Fritz gave an example of how it would transfer from US to Japan when you are moving funds from one point to the other. What we are used to 
is having centralized institutions as intermediaries. And that's what the way how current business is performed or being done today uh, in, a, in the current transactional world. What I'm here to provide you today is to give you a sense of how my 1,200-odd customers around the globe, cutting across 16 different industry verticals, are looking at technology and trying to identify themselves of how they would need to exist in the market beyond today for tomorrow, preparing themselves. How are they getting impacted? Today, all the disruptors who are coming about in the market, what is that that they have in common with the traditional companies? Actually, they don't have anything. What are they doing, actually? They are basically looking at a fundamental shift in the way how they can generate demand by putting zero cost in an effort to create a demand. They're putting zero cost in an effort to create a supply for what the demand would be able to create and a business model which can be provided completely by technology. We have several examples around the globe. Uh, we heard Uber already being spoken about. We know about Airbnb, and there are many others who are already causing that disruption in the market. What is the weapon that they are using? It's the digital technology which is coming at four, which is being utilized by all of them. And effectively, what they are doing is utilizing the concept of decentralization and disintermediation, which is effectively removing any mediators that are currently in process today for the business world. That's when blockchain comes in. The whole concept of how this intermediation and this decentralization effectively will be utilized by this concept of blockchain to disrupt and bring about a new wave of change into this industry. We all know that internet revolutionized the industry when it came about. We are thinking that blockchain is the way it will be viewed as how internet was viewed 30 years back when it came to the market. What does it effectively bring? It talks about peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction. It's a distributed ledger. We all know about that. Cryptography. The need of consensus. Of course, smart contracts. Ethereum, of course, was spoken a lot about today. Yes, it is, that's what it effectively it does. And most importantly, the way how it is being carried about is you don't need a trusted organization to sign off except for the miners who are providing you the proof of how this whole thing has to be carried about. This effectively means that it is decentralizing the trust and enabling the creation or flow of value through the different parties or entities who are going to interact without the need for any intermediaries. When you look at a blockchain ecosystem, how does an ecosystem in a blockchain really look like? It is effectively I'm just going to put this whole slide out for you to take a quick look at it. This is how the whole ecosystem effectively is looking like. You're looking at a transfer of value, you're looking at security, you're looking at regulation, there is a technology sitting right in the center. There is a cryptocurrency that probably will be utilized for different things. There will be a legal ecosystem, there will be a financial ecosystem. All that put together is creating a whole ecosystem around it. Now, mind you, when you're looking at this whole block, you will definitely see if you can relate this to the era of internet, which was created way back when it came 30, 40 years back, right? Today, we have a W3C consortium, which is looking at how the internet should be utilized and exploited. We have different forums in which it tries to formulate policies in the way how internet is being governed, is being utilized, is being allowed to exchange or restrict information flow from one point to the other. Each of these entities enlisted here need to come up with the same framework so that there is a trust which is created for the utilization of the technology so-called as blockchain. Some of the examples of what it would effectively lead down to, you have different things in which it can probably be utilized and that's what we are seeing, the whole concept of blockchain, the ecosystem, to create itself and to form itself. A classic example 
of what we are calling as a decentralized disintermediation, a lazus, which is essentially a, for transportation that was being built, the whole disruption that is being created by this particular entity is, it talks about the disruptive impact that it is creating. It's like a decentralized Uber, so taking the example of what Uber has created to the next level. It's also talking about different decentralization characteristics, essentially looking at how the economy could be shared, which effectively, if it translates to all your business, is how you would share the profits between two different entities. I'll cover a couple of use cases which are highlighted here at a very high level and try to relate to you of how this has already started as an impact. Uh, while we are still talking about that people are thinking about how the blockchain has to be utilized, there are many examples which are already coming about. IoT. Uh, it is being predicted that the world will be having close to a trillion plus devices which will be interacting with each other. The best way for them to talk to each other is being expected to be carried out through the whole concept of a blockchain. We are looking at a whole new paradigm of M2M communication using the whole concepts of blockchain. Gaming is a very classic example. I think everybody in the audience would recognize that Korea is a huge market as much as is Japan for gaming. We're looking at blockchain to disrupt this market completely in its own self. Election voting is one of the key things which everybody is looking at today. There are different ways in which uh, voting is being carried out. Um, Fritz mentioned in one of his uh, slides about India having started looking at blockchain, you'd be surprised to know that while India is one of those countries which uses electronic voting for its uh, uh, elections, uh, I know that uh, 9th May is a very crucial day for this country as well, but at the same time, this is a concept where blockchain is probably looking at creating a disruption uh, using this for the election. Uh, the other thing is in terms of the energy grids. Energy grids, there are different energy companies who are piloting the usage of blockchain to know what is the source of the energy which is being generated, who is consuming it, how much it is being consumed, how it is being transferred from one point to the other. To keep track of the whole thing is how it is uh, utilizing it today. And very instantly, uh, just in the morning, I was reading about a very classic example which uh, Bhuvan covered in his example about uh, ginseng farming. You'd be surprised to know that blockchain is trying to even invade farming as an example of how blockchain can be utilized for that in terms of making a clear uh, bundle of the product that is being produced by the farm, tracking it from where the produce has coming from, how did it travel, and it also keeps track of, because it tra keeps track of where it has been originated from, it keeps track of the kind of soil, it keeps track of the kind of environment that it has, it keeps track of the way how it has traveled from one point to the other, so you know how much it can be priced for, you know what is the uh, uh, expiration date that you can put onto the produce, and so on and so forth. The whole new paradigm of the concept of organic foods can really be brought to life when a blockchain can be utilized to provide such a feature for even an industry like farming. Uh, we definitely heard about music streaming. Uh, I'll just add to an example which Fritz gave. Uh, a classic example is that today you know that there are a lot of songs which are being written by young, upcoming, budding uh, sing songwriters and singers. Uh, we all know about K-pop in Korea. I'm pretty sure this will be a huge market in Korea, definitely. Uh, you can actually write a song, you can tag it, tag it to a Bitcoin, you can put it out there in the internet. People can use, uh, hear it, but if a movie producer wants to download it for his movie utilization, it effectively would mean that he has to pay for it. So in this particular case, the songwriter is protected of the creation that he has made and he gets his due without it being infringed upon or plagiarism happening for such a wonderful piece of work that he's created. A big boon to the music industry by in itself. Absolutely everything created and done, which is achievable now with this whole terminology of blockchain. Somehow this is not working, okay. How is TCS, being an IT company, looking at blockchain at an overall thing? We have started interacting with most of our customers in these 16 different verticals of 1,000 plus. We have created a platform 
for blockchain. We are looking at how to create uh, rapid prototyping, which can be done with different technology items uh, f uh, where blockchain could be used as a foundation. Uh, we have already created a lot of use cases and uh, proof of concepts. Uh, we have connected with different industries uh, utilizing that. Uh, we are doing a lot of pilots, and I'll give you an example about what we are doing there. But the advantage that we as a technology organization has, which is cutting across different industry verticals, is we have a lot of understanding of how the industry is evolving or shaping itself, how the concepts of decentralization and disintermediation is going to disrupt their business today, and thereby we can utilize the concepts of blockchain to bring a new, re, uh, to reimagine the way how they can probably do business for tomorrow. I am happy to share this with you all. We are already working, we have already finished a POC with ABN AMRO, uh, where it is effectively focusing on clearing and settlement. Uh, this was carried out uh, late last year, finished somewhere early this year. I mean, this is still the half the year, uh, as far as we know that, but it's, it was completed somewhere between January and uh, February. It's already been successfully piloted out uh, for the clearing and settlement. And along with this, just one example, there are like 10, 15 more examples that I can quote. The other classic big example that I can talk about is with Euroclear, which has 24 uh, CSDs that it is working with, and we are, uh, we are doing a pilot with them as well in terms of how the entire clearing and settlement uh, can be carried out, uh, which clearly highlights what kind of benefits uh, we have been able to achieve, uh, applying distributed ledger for all the straight through processing, removing uh, the trusted organizations who are providing the factor of trust today as far as clearing and settlement is concerned and using the concepts of blockchain, uh, though at a pilot level, but it has been very successfully received uh, by the company. Let me now slightly move towards how should organizations look at preparing and being aware of what they need to start looking at. Today, disruption is happening in the business. That's a reality. We cannot uh, avoid thinking that nothing is going to affect my business. Disruption, effectively, if you bifurcate into two broad categories as decentralization or disintermediation, you would look at how you can probably carry it out. The best way is to start looking at thinking of what are the areas you can start First, decentralizing your own business. There are different pockets of activity which can be carried out. Uh, something which my organization is also looking at, most important thing is how do you start removing the central command of decision making and allow your whole organization to start becoming a creative organization. TCS has close to 380,000 employees. Can you imagine the strength of power of Imagination and ideation that it can create for an organization of this size. Imagine the large corporates, the chibols in Korea, like Samsung and Hyundai and POSCO, allowing every individual employee in the organization to have an own, their own voice in the organization to pro put forth ideas of uh, how to decentralize their activities in their own organization is the first way of trying to look at disrupting their own uh, their own business by itself. Then there are different ways in which direct decentralization probably can be carried about, and of course, uh, a lot of disintermediation that you can probably look at. All of this is going to give rise to new business models, is going to give rise to the usage in of technology. Uh, there is already, uh, while we just got a, a quick crash course of what is blockchain about, uh, mind you guys, there's already a blockchain 2.0 which is already um, in the, uh, you, you can read a lot about it on the internet, it's already in the air and is already being utilized for different things, which is effective utilization of the whole concept of blockchain to the real industry. Uh, new markets, new ways of contracts are being formed. That's something which regulators will have to become aware of and would have to start utilizing this concept to bring about a change in their current business. Different businesses, different benefits that we can probably look at effectively. Uh, transparency and mutability is one of the key ones, uh, definitely, and uh, the quality without getting compromised is the others. Various challenges that we see 
uh, from a technology company standpoint, we all know it's a very nascent technology. We're looking at how this can be uh, progressed further. We have seen internet go through different phases. We expect that a technology like blockchain would also go through a similar hype cycle and it would reach its maturity following the standard Moore's law curve in terms of maybe another 10 to 15 years where you will not be able to utilize anything else other than blockchain with the new advent of things coming out with decentralization and disintermediation. In the end, I would only talk about, uh, for all of you and many more out there, is a technology disruption is practically at our doorsteps. There are a lot of investments that is already happening. Uh, people would not invest so, many, so much amount of money if it didn't have the promise that it, does, that it keeps on talking about. The request from a company like ours to all of you is do not wait. Start utilizing, start getting onto it. It's important to look at how would you master such a technology. It being completely new, it's the right time to start learning about it, and it will definitely go through the various curves, changes that it will happen over the next 10 to 15 years. It is important to start young and keep on keeping track of it so you know how the whole thing is going to progress and play out for your business. And most important of all, you have to master the new ways of how the new business models are going to evolve, utilizing this whole concept and technology, so-called blockchain. The last thing which I would like to leave as a message to all of you is that today, we in the technology company see that our biggest risk for us is the risk of not changing at all. So with that, I would like to end my session. Of course, look forward for if any of you would like to have any questions, any conversations about this topic, would be very happy to have that conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kamar. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, both uh, Fritz and Kamal, uh, sharing us with uh, your uh, uh, insight and expertise about blockchain. Uh, much appreciate. Uh, 저는 이 블록체인 기술이 어, 다양한 분야에서 적용될 것을 생각하면 사실 많이 설레이고 가슴이 뜁니다. 예, 한국이 그만큼 인프라 스트럭처 상으로는 정말로 그 세계 어느 나라보다 잘 갖춰져 있다고 생각을 하고요. 다만 지금 계속 그 연사들께서 얘기하시는 것처럼 펀더멘탈 체인지가 필요합니다. 우리의 인식에 우리가 그동안에 지금까지 우리 산업 구조를 갖고 왔던 그 인식의 전환이 이루어지는 순간 세계에서 정말 유명한 경제 잡지인 포브스에서 예상한 것처럼 한국은 정말로 전 세계에서 제일 중요한 파워 센터가 될 수도 있다는 거죠. 그 순간을 예, 학수 고대하면서 기다리겠습니다. 다음 연사로는 어, 네덜란드에서 오신 어, 아서 반 베이스 대표이십니다. 어, 지금 어, 법률 회사를 운영을 하고 계시고요. 예, 그리고 어, Next Generation Value Creation Institute의 공동 창업자이자 공동 대표로도 계시고 있습니다. 또 흥미로운 에, 우리 같이 활동한 것 중에 하나는 에, 올 2월 달에 에, 1월 말이죠. 예, 한국에서 어, 로스쿨 학생들이 어, 파견을 오셔가지고 한 10분 정도가 어, 이렇게 인턴십을 어, 처음 어, 하게 됐습니다. 그분 모두가 이제 그때까지만 해도 학생이셨는데 시험 본 모든 분들이 100% 합격하는 아주 경이로운 또 성과를 내셨습니다. 어, 아서 대표께서 어, 오늘 발표해 주실 내용은 어, IoT가 어, 만들어갈 새로운 세상에 대해서 어, 이야기를 해 주시도록 하겠습니다. 큰 박수로 모시도록 하겠습니다. 아서. <laughs> yes, all right, thank you very much. Upstairs. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? So, I'm Arthur, I'm a lawyer, uh, but also a tech law by design person and a success by design engineer. Uh, so I'm an entrepreneur already for 16 years. I started uh, my own company when I was 30 um, with all the incumbents, large law firms in Europe. Um, nobody did that at that point. But I think I really believe in uh, the power of the brain uh, while using, of course, a lot of tech to facilitate that. And I'm going to sh show you the blueprint in six easy steps for everybody 
to get success by design for yourself and your organization. Of course, focusing a bit on, on financial services in institutes, because uh, this is the track. Uh, so that's the example, but basically this is uh, applicable for everybody. So I'm talk about, I will talk about Internet of Things, uh, IoT. The, the, the name is not perfect, it's not about the thing. The best things in life are not things. But you know, just imagine Internet of Things, basically everything which you can virtualize, what you can put in cyber, what you can put at, as a web-based app, um, web application and in the cloud. So IoT is the te technology to do that. In order um, to get that running, you need to have computing. And cloud computing will be the topic and the component necessary, actually, for Internet of Things. Then the third element is data. A lot of data is nothing at all. But if it's structured and you know where it comes from and you can trust it, actually, you can get um, um, very knowledgeable and you can make decisions upon that and you can execute them. And, of course, the previous speakers talked about that uh, regarding blockchain. Blockchain is one of those very interesting and promising methodologies. It's not even a tech, tech technology, it's a methodology you can all think about. But there are more technologies and methodologies actually on the market. The general term is called data-centric security. So blockchain is, is, a, is a topic of that. So Internet of Things um, is not a very nice word. And smart, smart city, smart everything, is also not perfect. But because we're already pretty smart, but we can get smarter. Uh, and that's what this is about. And imagine you for yourself, what is your smart everything? What is your next smart? What do you want to smarten up? Right? So think about that. So why do we need to talk about this? Is it nice? Yes, it's a lovely topic, but it's also absolutely need to have. It's not only that I say it, but the government say it, the banks are saying it, industry are saying it, and not only Silicon Valley, anywhere in the world. This is a necessity. You don't need to be a techie, which is good news, I think, for most here, uh, but you need to understand and appreciate them and start talking with them and engaging with, with the tech, the, 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 the tech technicians, the engineers, and the software com com or computer scientists to understand what they're doing, and they uh, need to understand what you're doing. So Internet of Things, I'm not going to explain a lot about it, but just to show you a couple of things here on the slide. Um, an infrastructure, yes, you need to have an infrastructure. In this case, it's an infrastructure as a service, so it's a cloud uh, based uh, infrastructure. On top of that, so infrastructure is just basically infrastructure, nothing much more. Uh, network, communication, and an infrastructure. N a level on top of that is a platform, and platforms, of course, are interesting because you can actually start working, collaborating with each other. You can put application on top of that or in the platform, but you can also put devices, sensors, drones, anything on hardware, as, as long as it's connected. So devices is here the hardware layer. And the, S the SES is called Software as a Service, so that's the application part. And all the way up the top, you have the users and the data. And I'll you, I will explain you later why I put them together. So the green um, a, a crooked layer is basically where we're going from the device, the hardware layer, to the cyber world. And I will explain it like this. So we are all carbon-based people. We are all human beings. In order to get to the cyber world, to, in order to get to cloud and to Internet of Things, there is a hardware layer. You need to get through your mobile device, your screen, a sense or anything. So imagine that. And then you're moving into this world, which is um, uh, the virtual world, basically. So is it about te technology? No, it's actually about engagement. And it sounds easy, but don't forget it. It's not about tech. It's not about anything else than this. You want to collaborate, talk to each other worldwide, and uh, understand each other, and recognize the point of the other side. And of course, you want also the other side to recognize what you were saying. So, very legal, um, a, a short legal study. I studied a couple of years, but actually it's very simple. You have one person or organization or entity, and it's still smiling, and you have another one. And the only thing that lawyers do, and basically what we're doing, engagement, is the relationship between those two entities. There is always a legal relationship based on national law, international law, ethics, and there may be also contractual law, terms of service, uh, the, the fact that you have a relationship with the city, 
uh, or just a contract with your provider. So this is basically everything we learn in law school. Very simple. And now we have Internet of Things in it. And universities, any university, whether it's economics, whether it's legal, law, any university, but even computer science, they don't teach you the future, they teach you the history and the past. So I'm here to try to help you in also understanding and learning uh, how to think of in, in the future and, 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 and get some kind of playbook going on. So what do you need? You add stakeholders. Who is involved? It's not only your customer, it's not only your vendor, it's not only that one partner or the municipality, your soul or a country. There are a lot of stakeholders. It could be users, that you, it, it could be the non-users, people that don't use it, but don't like you, or are they not, not using it yet because they don't understand it. I mean, that's a very important group. The non-user is perhaps even more important than the user. And there are a lot of other ones. I'm not going to work through all of them, but you can read them. Customers, but also we have m malicious actors. We have hackers, you know, whether state-funded or otherwise. We have, of course, also governmental institutions, regulations, and authorities that need to understand what the heck we're doing with Internet of Things, cloud computing, data analytics, robotics, blockchain. They don't know yet. We need to explain it to, to them and get them in the comfort zone as well. So if you have all these stakeholders, you ne basically need to think about the relationship between one and two. So in this case, the user and the customer. One and three, the user and the supplier, one and four, et cetera. And so you need to, this is basically an exercise where you have more than 80 relationships. Try to think about them, plot them out, just very simple on, on a piece of paper, and see where the, the issues are, where the action is, and where the opportunities are. So again, this is about engagement. Add contextuality to it. It's not only um, about the, 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 the purpose that you thought it was, it's also about all of other, other purposes. So your mobile device, you're using it for your professional life, but also for your private life. Uh, it can also be used for uh, many other different purposes. So contextuality is absolutely essential to think about. So a car is, could be for many reasons why you have it or why you're driving it. Uh, or, and you probably in the future will not ha have any, anything, you just get one from your phone. So then at the end of the day, this is how Internet of Things look like. Again, we talked about Internet of Things, but I add a lot of people and organizations in it, and that is the point of my uh, presentation. But before we get there, you know, um, people start pointing to each other because they don't understand wha what we're talking about. So whose re responsibility is it to make a trustworthy and a workable, sustainable ecosystem? So how to get there? So a quick uh, six-step approach first. Vision, that's the future. What is your vision for the future? Where do you want to get at? It could be one point on the ho 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 horizon now. The point will change along the way, and that's fine. But try to think of the, of the, of the point. Where do you want to aim for? Aiming is uh, nice, but you need to know where to start. So your point of reference is today. That's the status quo. Where are you today? So you have now one point, which is the, f the, 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 f the vision, you have the status quo of today, you check what's going on and prepare, and I will, I will tell you what, what that means. Preparation is everything for the journey, because indeed, otherwise you have a failure by the de 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 design right away, you want to have success by design, and then you start the journey. The journey will not be straight ahead to the vision, to that point on the horizon, it will be a Bumpy ride, you will need to pivot, it will be need to go certain ways, which is great. And don't stop, just be bold, bold about it and agi agile. Don't think that you will fail if it, the first step is not perfect or is not the one that you would, uh, would make. G get a step back and do, uh, do another one. So this is how it looks like uh, when you make a graphic. So you have the vision, you have the status quo, think about preparation on the state-of-the-art level, the SOTA. State of the art basically means what's already on the market. What does uh, the, the other countries do in uh, what do the other uh, cunt countries do in Asia? What do they do in Europe and in the U.S. and in Brazil and all over the place? Um, what can I learn from that? And how can I actually improve it? And there's so much on the market that you can work with, but still the journey will be like sailing on the ocean. It's not a, a straight road. Step two, back to basics. So now you have a vision, you know where you want to go to, 
but everybody talks a different language. Semantic interoperability, not in the language between uh, uh, the uh, national la languages, but also computer languages, um, but also law systems and authorities, they all speak a different language. So we need to go back to basics and find the, top, the, the, the same wording and definition. And I would start, I can recommend you to start with this. It's people, process, technology, and knowledge. So there are four, not three. The knowledge is there. People is in the middle. It's a human-centric approach. It's not about te technology. It's not about uh, the process. It's about the people. So this is the way to, uh, to do it and get back to basic. What are we actually talking about here? And it's funny to see how, many, how little uh, the very modern companies, the unicorns that we'll talk about, uh, are into this. They, they forget a lot of these things. And I think we can get to a disruptive model to disrupt them. And that's, of course, what we are looking for. In a financial uh, ser uh, services ecosystem, it's not, it's not about the bank. It's not only about the customer. It's also about your vendors and your partners. It's the whole ecosystem. Um, only thinking about customers will not work at all, uh, but uh, because you need to think about the whole ecosystem. It's, it's the mix. Then what is funny is that even though there are you know, large organizations now that have billions of followers and bil billions of users, there is no bank yet that has a billion customers. And that is a nice point on the ho horizon, a vision. How to get there? I want to be a bank that has a billion customers. And the BBVA, a, a bank from Spain and South, South America, has that vision and already running on, on clouds uh, for the larger part of their uh, bank, which is quite impressive. So, again, engagement is important. Step three. Now we start investing. Now we have a vision and, um, and we have a common ground on wh where we want to start and how we get there. So we don't get into discussions and conflicts along the way. We invest in digital and get hyper-connected. Sounds easy. We already had a, a couple of great presentations already. So uh, that's why I have a, a, a brief slide on this. Um, dig investing, what does it mean? Well, investing is in other way. Don't spend a billion dollars or euros uh, on, um, on buying tech technology, but start, th start thinking where you are in the, in the whole ecosystem. And a bank, for instance, is not a vertical anymore. It used to be, and now it's a horizontal. It's all over the place. So if you're a smart car and you're charging your car somewhere, at that point, the bank is important to make the valuable trans uh, a transaction between a trusted transaction with one, one between A and B. Uh, so it, it's not a vertical anymore, and it's nice. I think every industry is not a horizontal anymore. Also here in Korea, very impressive, very huge companies, uh, but they need to think about that they are a horizontal. See, where do I fit in this ecosystem? If you don't fit in the ecosystem, fine. There is another ecosystem where you fit in a couple of times as, uh, as well. More good news. So we had IoT, cloud computing, and data. Banks are one of the richest uh, data richest industries in the world. And actually, it's very structured data. And they're, they're not using it very nicely, or properly, or they don't use it at all, because they think they're not entitled to. Well, they are, but they don't do it. So and again, there are already assets within a company, which is your new goal. So it's not selling it to everybody, but using it in the right sense. So you get your trust for your customers, but you also get your new customers in. Step four. Right, so now we, have, um, uh, we want to invest in digital and, and tech technology, but now a lot of issues on the, on the market. There are all risk, I understand it. So I'll give you a couple of things. Personal data protection, privacy, big thing in the European Union, as you know. Um, and this is a barrier for all these topics. So you're now in the boat, you're sailing the right way, you have done the, the proper steps, and now they're, they're all those big issues pop up. Uh, privacy, cybersecurity and security pop up. Safety, a car that is hacked, a cybersecurity car, uh, it, it, it's hacked with, with, through cybersecurity, and now it's a safety issue. Oh, we, are, we don't want to do this. This is just, I'm too scared. Let's forget about it. Let's go back to the safe harbor. The another one is compliance, which of course is uh, uh, a big thing uh, and very important at banks. But uh, compliance is not an issue, it's, it's, it's part of the so, a solution. You need to have another look at it. Um, so, and I'm not able to do that in 20 minutes to, to explain you what it is. The other one is insufficient knowledge, actually number one. So this is a list 
of um, the Euro Eurostat, our Statistics Bureau of the European Union. These are the num four issues for people that say, well, I don't know what's go going on. And we, of course, as being a lawyers, help out uh, organizations, also government authorities, to get this out of the way, basically snow plowing the road. So you get the clear road and you can start, uh, continue your journey. So it's very nice, um, but um, uh, there's a lot of knowledge in the market. There's data and systems. Uh, we have IoT and data analytics. But where is actually the data? Well, actually the data is in our heads. 70% of all the knowledge is in our heads. It's not in systems, only 30% is. So again, the human, uh, the human factor is underrated. We are underrated. So um, you're very, we're all very important. Uh, as you, uh, so don't forget that. Um, if you don't add, if they don't add the 70% in tech, tech, knowledge in systems, uh, you know, it's not really a, a smart system, right? Step five. So we have invested one euro or 100 euros or a million euros in tech. Now you need to spend times four in organization and people. So again, one euro in uh, buying nice stuff, Internet of Things, sensors, now you need to invest in, in your people and organization. This is forgotten a lot, uh, and uh, that's why you see a lot of failures on the market. Bec again, they, they think they can automate people. No, you facilitate people with this. Huh? Why? Well, this, the OECD. I showed this last year as well, but you know, I really like this to, uh, to make it, uh, this is so relevant. 65% of people, kids that are in schools already today, will have jobs that do not exist yet. So it's basically our job to find what actually is the job description that they would have in only 15 years. Uh, so uh, is I, I feel it as, our, as, as my responsibility to help out with this. And I hope you will help out. So. Technology is important. It was a, a presentation about IoT, and I want to show you that IoT is not about the thing, it's about the combination. A combination which is called multiplicity. It's a symbiosis of uh, diverse groups of people connecting with diverse groups of robots, algorithms, sensors, and capabilities. So diverse groups here, diverse groups there. The symbiosis is called multiplicity. So we, I'm not scared about robots or that they're going to dis disrupt us. They're going to facilitate us with this multiplicity. The nice thing is we cannot do this as humans without computing. So it's a, we need to, we actually we need each other. We need tech, technology and technology needs us. This is Wells Fargo, large bank from San Francisco. And they are absolutely, it's for them impossible to organize 250,000 people without cloud computing. So let's step six, that's the last one. Uh, now we are, okay, we have people, uh, diverse groups of people, and diverse groups of people means ages. So people um, from 25, 20, uh, 35, 45, 55, all the way up, including also lawyers, engineers, computer scientists, business economics, um, um, everybody needs to actually be combined here. So the co-creation I'm talking about, is not a single topic. It's a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary topic. And we c I call this the cycle of reason, because if you don't do this, uh, it's not going to happen. Func functionality is what technology companies focus on a lot. And they focus perhaps a little bit on the user interface. If they focus on user interface, they are very, very valuable companies. And the examples were all uh, already made. Um, but then you need also think about the trust factor. Will the user start using these products if they don't trust it, if it's not secure, personal data is all over the place, um, if, if it's not feasible, if it's just too expensive? Uh, so this is the, uh, the cycle. And where do we get that? We get at the computer chip. So that's in the middle here. And that's a, it's a long word. It's multi-layered, so it's like a computer chip. It's cross-cutting, so it's not one layer not talking to the other, but they to talk to each other. It's interdisciplinary. I already explained that to you. It's integrated. Without integration, it's siloed, it's standalone, and it's a failure. And it's, of course, an architecture. So the whole package is how you get to success by design. Uh, and I know I only have 20 minutes. It's a big topic. But I, um, I do hope you uh, appreciate this, that this is one of these um, uh, topics that is not a problem, but actually 
a solution. So with that, thank you very much for uh, listening, and I hope to talk to you after this presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Yeah, You're very welcome. nice. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks for sharing your insight. 어, 우리 아서 대표께서 이제 이야기하신 것처럼요. 예, IoT의 세상은 또 다른 문제거리와 골칫거리를 우리에 안겨주실 안겨주는 것인지 아니면 우리가 가지고 있는 문제들을 해결하는 솔루션이 될 것인지 그 후자에 예, 저도 크게 공감을 하는 바입니다. 어, 정말로 우리 더치 나온 아주 예, 진취적인 프리젠테이션이었습니다. 예, 다시 한번 감사드리고요. 어, 금융은 여러분 금융은 그 나라가 속해 있는 비즈니스의 랜드스케이프를 벗어날 수가 거의 없습니다. 그 나라가 정말로 매니팩처링 매니팩처링에 포커스되어 있는 그런 산업 구조를 가지고 있으면 그 산업 구조 안에 있는 A, B, C, D를 어, 제일 큰 그러한 기업들을 여러분들의 고객으로 어, 가지고 있는 게 대부분이죠. 그 바운더리를 벗어나는 영역으로 가기에는 쉽지 않은 그러한 챌린지가 있습니다. 지금 우리가 이렇게 4차 산업혁명, 새로운 초연결성 시대를 이야기하는 것이 금융산업의 중요한 이유는 바로 새로운 금융의 먹거리가, 새로운 금융의 가치가 창출될 수 있기 때문입니다. 우리 다음 연사 분도 멀리서 오셨습니다. 어, 노르웨이에서 오셨고요. 노르웨이도 역시 어, 오일 이 주요 인컴인 그러한 나라에서 새로운 혁신을 통해서 경제 구조의 전환을 꾀하는 나라 중에 하나입니다. 노르웨이 제일 큰 어, 은행 중에 하나인 스페어뱅크 원에서 오신 어, 우리 디지털 취프 디지털 오피스이신 어, 크룻 상무님을 모시도록 하겠습니다. 크룻, please. <웃음> Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Now, see if I get the switch. Okay, I, um, I come from the second largest bank in Norway, this very strange country way up in the north. It's large in distance, but uh, we're just five million people, so we're about half of Seoul. Uh, before going on, I just need to know the audience. Could you please raise your hand if you work in a bank or a financial institution? Not that many? Huh? About half? Okay. So I will, um, you know, we're in banking, we're now in a sort of a perfect storm. It's a little bit what we heard about this this morning, so I'll not go through this in detail. A lot of forces at the same time are hitting us uh, as banks, and what should we, do, should we do about that? Now, you could say that banks, well, we've been investing a lot in technology over the years, right? So we're really on bleeding edge. I mean, we have internet banks, we have mobile banks, we're doing chat, we're doing banking. Facebook, but I would claim that what we're really doing hasn't changed since banking was invented in Italy some five, six hundred years ago. You know, the name bank, banca in Italian means the counter where you exchange money. And the, if you look at the value chain, banking is really simple. We take some money from the ones who has a little bit too much and we give it to some people who need money. And when that didn't add up, we invented some capital markets to do the funding, and then we communicate with the customers. Okay, we've used technology to communicate, but there's a direct connection between the customer and the bank. Now, this is changing. There are some people trying to come in between the bank and the customers. We've had a little bit of that historically, but now it's happening big time. But there, and that's a misconception of bankers. We believe everybody else wants to do banking. I can tell you the secret, they don't. Banking is a boring business, a lot of regulations, compliance, and you need a lot of money and capital to do banking. People don't want to do banking. But then why do they come into this? And we have to understand why they're doing that. And they are different animals. One of them are the retailers. I'm sorry, this is probably more European than a Asian names. Maybe you know some of them. They didn't, don't want to do banking, but they want to sell their goods and services. And they want to make damn sure that it's very easy to pay for those goods and services. 
And if you're there and you want to buy this fantastic new Samsung TV and you don't have money, they want to make it very easy for you to lend you the money there and then so you can walk out the shop with this new TV. But they don't want to do banking. Then we have a lot of these fintech companies coming in. They thought they were going to do banking, but they found out it's quite difficult and a lot of compliance. So they don't want to do banking either, but they want to communicate with the customers. And they think they can take the data from banks and present it to the customer in a much better way than banks can do. And that's where they want to, most of them now, want to make their money and start cooperating with banks instead to do all the boring back office stuff. And then we have all these technology giants coming in. Do they want to do banking? Not necessarily. If you think, think of something like say Facebook, you have that, right? How many of you have customers of Facebook? You don't use Facebook here? How many? Come on. It's a trick question. You're not customers of Facebook. You're the product. The customers of Facebook are the advertisers. They are the ones paying to Facebook. What Facebook is selling is data about you. And if Facebook can understand what you are buying every day and where you're buying it, the value of that data increases tremendously and they can send, sell much more advertising. That's why they want to go into this space. And most of these are the technology giants as well. That's the reason. They don't want to go in boring traditional banking. And as banks, we have looked into this and said, we, want to, we need to be in this space as well. So we've started, at least in Norway, developing various, and in the Nordics, mobile wallets type of things, trying to be fintech companies as well as banks. And there is a big difference now also that we have to start dealing with users and not customers. Traditionally in banking, if you didn't have a bank account, you were not a proper person, you were not a customer, right? But now we have to make many-to-many -many solutions that can work across various banks. You connect to people without necessarily them having an account with you, which is also a big difference and a mental shift for banks. Now, this picture is not correct, the one I showed you. It's actually more like this. They don't put themselves on top of our channels. They want to take away the channels and connect directly to the underlying banking products. And to make that even easier for them, in Europe, the European Commission has actually now introduced some regulation that says banks actually need to open up. So it's very easy connecting to the back office of the banks. So either we can look at this and be moved backwards to being a pure sort of product provider and losing the connection with customers, or we need to do something. At least in Norway, we found out that to be able to fight this, we can't fragment the market. If every bank tries to do this in their own way, we just open up the country for these big technology giants coming in and taking the whole market. So we've actually joined forces, most of the Norwegian banks, now to build one mobile ba wallet to do all kinds of payments in Norway. And we think we can do that much cheaper than anyone else, avoiding the international credit card schemes that are quite expensive. That's really what the end customer wants. They don't want various different wallets and how can I pay this and pay this differently. And all the merchants also want to have one way of receiving a payment. I'll skip this. And... Uh, so, but everything is now happening is happening on the mobile. The mobile is actually the driver, the mobile phone, for what is happening. And I find this picture is quite, I thought it was funny. I, I know the resolution is bad, but it's a mobile phone, right? <laughs> and we've all been building mobile banking. I'm sure you have that as well. But really, if you look at it, it's been somehow the internet bank on a small screen, isn't it? We, we produce sort of the bank statement on a small screen, and then we've added some graphics and also some analysis to tell you how, how you have spent your money. How interesting is the bank to tell you what you have spent? What you want to do is to understand how can I spend in the future? So we have to move this into vir being virtual advisors, using all this data for predictive analysis to see can I afford this 
before my next salary come in? Can I afford this and still do the vacation that I planned this summer? Then you add some value to the customer. And if you look at a lot of these fintech companies, that's exactly the space where they operate. They want to try to do predictive analysis, being your virtual personal financial advisor. And that's something, there's no reason why these companies should do that better than banks. We have all the data, we have huge technology departments, there's no reason why we can't be the best ones in this game. But we have to wake up and think differently. We also have to communicate with customers differently. I know this is Norwegian, you don't understand it. The point is you can chat, you can talk to customers over the mobile using some of the features rather than the old boring screens. And for some reason, young people want to talk like that. I mean, if you're older, you want to see all your finances look more like a spreadsheet, right? And you get all the numbers, uh, yes, that's what it is. Young people, they want to talk to the bank and get it one at a time. Takes too much time, but you know this one? This is Venmo in the US. It's owned by PayPal. It's a sort of peer-to-peer -peer payment, but it has something more. You can it's public. Who pays to who? Not public to everyone, but among friends and colleagues and so on. So you can comment. When someone has done, the, if you pay to this, you, I can comment it. And I can even do like I do on Facebook. I can like it. It's crazy, right? Nobody over the age of 21 would invent this. But this is what the market wants. It's fabulously popular in the US. that are cheaper, more secure, and faster ways of paying, but this is what they're using. Amazing. And of course, why should we chat? We can talk with this machine, right? I, I'm sorry this is uh, an Apple example, and I'm in Korea, I know that, but <laughs> I come from a country where they have 60, 70% of the market, sorry. So you don't need to chat, you can actually talk to this phone and ask them to pay something. The first, when I presented this internally, people say, but, but, but what about security, right? We need some pin code or something to make this work. No, you don't need pin code. This machine has speak recognition. It knows that it's you that's talking. It can even hear if you have a gun to your head and someone is forcing you to do the payment and see that this doesn't sound like you normally sound, I won't do it. That, no bank does that, but theoretically. So the, and uh, this uh, example, uh, a bank in Germany, M26, actually launched that last year, that you can talk to Siri and transfer money. Why not? So we have to start utilizing the features of the mobile, not just as a small screen, but something more. I saw coming in yesterday that you have Starbucks here as well. Do you know what it is, American Coffee Company? They have loads of customers and they have their loyalty program and apps on the phone where you could also pay for coffee, but very few people used it to pay for the coffee. Small percentage until Starbucks did one thing. And what was that? You could pre-order your coffee. You go on a mobile and say, I want a double cappuccino, so I have a... And then when you enter into the coffee shop, it's ready-made. And they just, here's your coffee, sir. Here's your ca cappuccino, madam. And the sword, the number of people using it. And then they add the GPS. So if you walk, and a lot of people walk to, the, to work every day, same route. And when you're 200 meters from Starbucks, it pops up on your phone. Do you want your regular cappuccino today? And you say, yes. And then you walk into Starbucks, you get it, and you walk out. Payment is frictionless. It just explodes how many people are using it. So you have to think a little bit differently, utilizing the possibilities. And again, sorry, iPhone, but it's a, it's a birthday, you know, this year. It's, it was invented 10 years ago the smartphone that we're now using as an extension of our body. We can't live without it. It's just 10 years old. And it's quite amazing if you look at how quickly we now adopt new technology. This slide shows how long time does it take until you have 50 million users of a new technology. And you know, with the telephone, it took some years. And now it's getting quicker and quicker. And maybe some of you know where I'm now going because something happened last summer. This one? 
took 10 days. And someone else here said, you like gaming in Korea, so you probably use this. 10 days to have 50 million users. But okay, this is games, right? This is not something for banks. I mean, we're serious people. But why did it take 10 days for Pokemon Go? Because there are loads of games out there that don't get 50 million users. It's the technology behind it. It's this augmented reality technology that made this so hugely popular. And that's something we can utilize. This is from a bank in New Zealand. When you walk on the street, you have your phone, you can see that this house is for sale, and it gives you the information. And you can go inside and see what the house looks like. This is from Fifth Avenue in New York, where you can locate the closest branch and ATM and so on. On a mobile, this is me paying in internet what we could do. This is from High Street in Tromsø, way up north in Norway. And you can, if you hold your phone, see that here's a property for sale. Here you get a discount on your hamburger today. Here you can use your credit card and get something. So it's more the fantasy that's stopping you, right? But this is, even if it starts in gaming, you can use it for real stuff. And we're now, sorry about this, I talk very fast because Bohan asked me to do that, because we're into coffee break already. We've just launched this usage-based insurance, connected cars, where you put this little thing in your car, and you can get a cheaper insurance if you're a good driver. And you get a score, and you can see on your phone and follow it when, when you've done a ride, was this a green, a yellow, or a red one? Now, we've done, a lot of people have tried this, and of course, you don't want to be, you, I don't want the insurance company to supervise my driving and where I am and so on. But we've done two things that we believe will make this popular. One thing is we've taken a device that does not have a GPS, which means we don't know where you are. It's very important. And we don't, then we don't know if you break the speed limit but it tracks braking, acceleration, g-forces. So if you drive like crazy, we will not increase your insurance premium. But if you drive nicely, we will reduce it. But you, it's, you can only win, you can't lose. And if, you borrow, and if your son borrows the car and says, I drove like a saint, and you can look on your mobile and say, no, you didn't. <laughs> so that kind of supervision we have. So hopefully this will pick up. And so what I've been trying to say is that do you really utilize the mobile? Do you try to get real customer engagement? Do you use a lot, utilize those facilities that are out there? Or are you still just providing the internet bank on a much smaller screen that is harder to read? So I think now everybody needs coffee rather than listening to me, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, it was much enjoyable. Thank you. Coffee uh, break 전에 잠깐 예, 질문 혹시 있으신 분 있으면 한두개 정도 받고요. 혹시 있으신가요? 아니면 다 끝나고 하실까요? 예, 예 끝나고 하시죠. 커피 브레이크 하시기 전에 어, 다음 세션에 우리 폴 이스케 교수님 그리고 떼오 마셀 어, 얀 그리고 우리 저 어, MIT에서 오신 어, 클리핑거 교수님들이 어, 정말로 또 아주 어, 깊이 있는 강연을 해주실 예정이십니다. 만약에 여러분 뭐 바쁘셔서 어쩔 수 없는 스케줄 있으시면 할수 없지만 됐으시면 꼭 남으셔가지고 들으시는 게 정말로 여러분들 올해 큰 선물이 될 거니까요. 어, 커피 브레이크 10분 하시고 어, 40분에 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. <웃음>